Good evening, everyone, and, and thanks for being part of this chapter training, which is all about research and analysis. And uh, as you figured out, we've purposefully made this a Zoom meeting rather than a Zoom webinar um, to make it more interactive. And we'll be recording it to use for future trainings. And I recommend everyone switch their view to speaker view if you haven't already done so, um, but it's up to you. And as everyone knows, American Promise really has one goal, and it's a big one. It's to ratify an amendment to the US Constitution to restore American democracy in which we the people, not big money, not corporations, not unions or special interests, govern ourselves by July 4th, 2026. And we know this amendment can't be won in DC boardrooms with closed door handshakes. It has to be won state by state, person by person across the country. And to do this, we work to provide an ongoing structure of support meant to empower you to advance this amendment forward meaningfully where you live. And this training tonight is one piece of that structure of support. And it's focused all about effective research and analysis strategies. But before we get into it, let's just remind ourselves why we're working towards this in the first place. And we're gonna go sort of back to basics here. And I'm hoping that someone will volunteer to share one, where you're from, and two, what it is that motivates you to be on this call tonight. Why do you care about something as big and as important as a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics? So is there one person who would kick us off by volunteering? And the answer can be really short, um, just 30 seconds or so. I, I see Joan with her hand up. So Joan, take it away. Thank you for leading us here. Uh uh, I'm from Southern New Jersey, and um, my motivation is that uh, every time we turn around, we see the number, the dollars being spent by uh, dark money organizations getting larger and larger. It's unsustainable, and it's drowning out the voice of, of the people. And we want our legislators and politicians to be answerable to us and not to be constantly having to raise money. Uh, it's really distorted our politics, and we and I feel that it's an underpinning to any other reforms across the board that we want to get made, and that's why I think it's it's a critical issue, and why I've chosen to focus on it. Great, thank you, Joan, and I know you've been volunteering with American Promise for you know just about the the whole time, at least the whole time I've been here. So thanks for continuing to to work and, and help this effort. And um, I'd love to hear from one other person at least, and you can just unmute yourself and um, go ahead if you feel so inclined. I'm Robbie Duda and I'm from, uh, I'm a nurse and I am just appalled at that, how much money in politics affects healthcare. And um, I'm, I'm very uh, involved because of that. Great, thank, thank you, Robbie, I think everyone is is hyper aware of how money in politics or I shouldn't say everyone but an increasing amount of people of how money in politics affects health care and public health so um, incredibly important to make that connection even more clear um, and let's hear from one more person uh, about where they're from and, and why they're on this call. I'm Joan Ridley and I'm in Dallas, Texas. Grew up in southern New Jersey. Um, I'm interested because big money gets uh, candidates elected, but gerrymandering keeps them there. We've got to stop both of those initiatives. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's so important to see sort of the forest through the trees and, you know, to understand how our amendment sort of fits in this reform landscape and how, you know, gerrymandering is a good example of, you know, a really additional sort of wicked problem that, you know, is eroding our popular democracy. And um, I, I know Jeff describes the metaphor, which I've always found quite apt of, you know, there's a house and, you know, there's floorboards kicked in and windows busted out. And, you know, the amendment is sort of that foundational base level that we need to get right to be able to get to the other 
nooks and crannies that need fixing and, and gerrymandering is right there, you know, um, access to the ballot, you could go on and on and on, but it, it's, we're not doing this in a vacuum, we're doing this in a larger reform ecosystem. So thank you guys for sharing and, and we're gonna have some more um, interactive questions as we get going here, but we'll keep it rolling. Um, so we're gonna dive in here now and I, I'd recommend at least one person in each chapter volunteer to take notes. Um, you don't have to, you know, have that be an exact science. And I know it might be kind of hard to coordinate with your chapter members if there's multiple of you on the call in real time. So um, don't don't stress about it if it's a hassle at all. And, and there's no need to write everything down. There will be a detailed follow up and a summary, and this will be recorded. Um, so you know, just as you're listening, if there are points that really resonate with you, um, you know, good to be in that mindset of of jotting down key things. But just to sort of give an overview of, of what we're doing with these five trainings, that this is the first one. Um, in order to build and sustain the political power necessary to ensure your state successfully um, drives the amendment out of Congress and ratifies it through your state legislature, American Promise is providing five thorough trainings to establish chapters on some, some major important skills um, with, with additional training and support layered along the way with you know Slack trainings led by um, the North Texas folks or trainings on how to have Zoom calls or trainings on how to improve your laser talk sort of layered in as we go. But it, this research and, and analysis training is the first of these five trainings focused on one big thing of getting your state ready to ratify this amendment. And the following four that we'll do are networking for success, building a state campaign, rolling out your campaign, and finally leveraging that campaign to victory. But um, before we go further, I, I do just want to emphasize one really critical thing. It's, it's that I don't have a perfect blueprint for any of this. Um, we're trying to do something really of historic proportions. And we, of course, draw on lessons learned from past successful constitutional amendments. There's absolutely no magic formula. So in any great nationwide movement, there is one constant, and, and that's that people lead the way state by state, and they do it their way. So I, I really say this to emphasize this truth that your success doesn't rest on following these trainings, for example, 100%. Um, it rests on taking these supporting guidelines and you know, assessing yourself which parts add value to you and your chapter wherever you are and adapting them as necessary. So the intended outcome of this training tonight is really to put you in the headspace to deeply think through and over time answer this question, which is what is it about my state that I should know that will be useful in moving this constitutional amendment forward. So before I share with, with you guys different categories that as an organization we found helpful to think through in the past, um, let's think this through together. And you know, we can sort of do popcorn um, you know, shouting out here, but is there anyone who wants to volunteer to answer part of this question? There's, there's no right or wrong answer, but what is it about my state that I should know that would be useful in moving this constitutional amendment forward here in my state? And I know it's a big question and I don't, I'm not asking anyone to give a super long answer. And in fact, there's probably a lot of different really useful answers. So what's one of them, one category of information helpful to know as we're trying to grow awareness for this constitutional amendment among a diverse group of people winning support from our elected officials through all levels of government. I'll open it up here for people to float out some answers. Well, for, uh, the state, thing, go ahead. for the state of Minnesota, one thing that might be able to be leaned upon is the fact that uh, I think for the last, I don't know, Linda, Vicki, others help me out here, but I think the last five or six elections, Minnesota has led the nation in voter turnout. So the fact that there's huge voter turnout 
is it's a absolutely relevant information that says, you know, one, people go to the polls, two, people pay attention to who they're voting for, and three, you know, people might, for instance, be more attuned to hearing say that their, their candidate signed the candidate pledge, for example. Um, you know, that immediately could be a useful way to think through what, what that would mean. Um, anyone else want to take a crack at some of these categories, which again, there, there's no right or wrong answers. Uh, this, this Jerry Morton in Tennessee, uh, a lot of the organizations that uh, I've tried to uh, influence in one level or another, there are the established leaders but there are a group of people behind those leaders that are real influencers. And people, particularly in rural communities, but I think in all communities, when that decision comes up, they go to the quiet leaders, not to the ones that are shouting that, I, that they're the leader in the elected office. It's the quiet people that are the influencers in these communities. Yeah, so, you know, who is it that is influential to particular people that we're trying to convince? You know, it might not be the 10 people that we need to talk with, but it might be that one person that if we can get them on board, that'll have an outsized impact. Um, I see Judy Butler has her hand up. So thanks for sharing, Judy. Yeah, hi, um, I'm from Delaware, very small state. Um, which I found really helpful in our efforts. Mm -hmm. We only have three counties and this state is such that you can, I mean, we see the governor on the, on the street downtown in Wilmington. We see Biden on the street, not so much anymore, but we do. Um, and so it's a very sort of down home state. Uh, people know each other. Um, you can easily get to know all of the legislators down in Dover. Um, so, and, and one thing we discovered <laughs> And I was part of a wolf pack because they, they don't like heavy handedness. Um, they like uh, civilized engagement. Yeah. So, you know, sort of what is, this is a, this is a, a, a really, I think, hard, but, but important question to think through and tell me if this is sort of what you're getting at, but, you know, the temperament of, you know, the political discourse in my state, is it, is it charged and, you know, rife with aggression, or is it a little bit more um, diplomatic and polite? Um, you know, and and might that vary depending on who I'm talking to or which part of the state they're in and how long they've been in the legislature or in Congress? Um, it's a hard question to answer, um, but it but it's potentially a really good one to to answer piece by piece. Um, Anyone else with, with some suggestions here? I think the big, the big industries are the ones that worry me the most. In California, it's going to be all about real estate and agriculture and energy. <laughs> Those are, by definition, big, big, big money. It's going to be yeah. big, big everything. And it's not going to be people because the people are behind this 100%. It's what else is happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who are the, what are the major industries that are consistent donors? Um, you know, what are the political pressures that, you know, the California elected officials feel um, from industries that, that are having an outsized role in current events? Um, sort of an extension as well. What are the relevant current events um, going on in my state. If, if you're in Pennsylvania, for example, you might be hyper attuned to, you know, who's getting money from the fracking industry as it's, you know, a big industry in, in Pennsylvania and, you know, geographically, um, you know, you can see, okay, well, if they're in the Marcellus Shale part of the state, then they're more likely to listen to people um, in X industry versus Y industry. It's 
um, open secrets really is, I think that sort of leading resource that does a lot of that research um, ready made for us to, to take and, and think through. Um, anyone else with, with a category or two here? Yeah, Hank, go ahead. Uh, it's, this is kind of a kind of an addition, a different angle on what you just said, and, and that is, um, we suspect that in addition to, you know, if you were raised can you hear up people, him. can you hear me now? Can anybody if hear you me? Can talk a little, if you can try to talk a little bit louder, Hank, that would be helpful. Okay, I don't know why this is working right. Um, I got a technical problem up here, let me fix it. Okay. Um, Great. Anyone else with the category here? Yeah. Hi, I'm Veronica Fernandez from Northern New Jersey. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what, what I think is important to know is where all of our current representatives stand with signing the pledge and being on board with the pledge. And here in New Jersey, we do have some who will readily sign it. And then we have others who kind of hedge because they think they need to fight fire with fire. So it, it's a little tricky. But I think like right now, after this election that we just had in November, almost all candidates are fatigued from fundraising and, and, and at, at how much and how ugly and how much it costs. So I think what's really good is how unifying it is. I mean, um, regardless of the temperature of the state, I mean, this issue is unifying uh, and we all desperately need something to be behind right now together. So um, I think knowing where our representatives are uh, t letting them know that this is unifying and that, uh, you know, all sides are for this. And um, uh, I think that's it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's critically important. Just, you know, understand how to assess, well, what's already been done in my state, you know, whether it's who's signed the American Promise Candidate Pledge, perfect example, whether it's who is, if we're talking about Congress, an existing co-sponsor of federal bills that specifically move this amendment forward. Um, we're going to talk more about how to how to assess that in, in just a couple of minutes here. Um, you know, if you're looking at the state level, has there been a successful state legislative resolution in my state before? Um, or if there haven't, if there hasn't been, have there been past attempts? Um, we talk about unitedforthepeople.org as a really useful resource all the time. And a huge reason is it, it chronicles in, in really thorough detail um, this type of state and, and even local activity, you know, at the um, Morris County commissioners, for example. Um, you know, I don't know if they have or if they haven't, but passed a local resolution in favor of this amendment that that's really good information to know and usually a a smart starting point just to do sort of an assessment, an audit almost of what's been done. Um, and that's often a really good way to blueprint out well, where, where do we want to go based on that one? What don't we need to do again? Um, anyone else with? You also have to know what, what tools are available in your state in terms of referenda and non-binding resolutions mm -hmm. at the state and the local level because certain states do that and certain states don't. Mm -hmm. So you have to know what the infrastructure is in terms of uh, ways that this can be supported in your specific state. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so this... um, right, it's Vicki from Minnesota. Um, yeah, right now in particular, it probably would be good to know what your state's legislative session looks like going into this year. If, if you have a new session starting, I know everybody state's different. Um, what kind of work are they doing on COVID? I mean, how, uh, what are the instructions to the legislators as far as what kind of bills are, they're gonna be able to move, that kind of thing. I know I had a communication with a legislator today um, who said he's, he's not able to introduce any bills that aren't related to his specific committee because they've been limited 
uh, because of COVID and budget year and all this other stuff that was unfinished because of COVID last year. So um, it's important to know, I think, what your legislative session mm-hmm. looks like and what's being asked of your legislators mm-hmm. before you go in and, and try and move something so you don't end up banging your head against the wall. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. You know, and I was thinking through, well, how, how to talk about research and analysis, sort of broad topic and the session in Minnesota, you know, might be four months and the session in Alaska is one month. And, you know, there, there's so many variations state by state in this, this big democracy that we have. Um, a- after this training, um, t- tomorrow morning, most likely, um, we are going to, to share a document um, with with each chapter. So don't worry about, you know, writing down all of these categories or, you know, writing down all of these recommended resources for chronicling all of this information, but, but we'll share sort of a template document with each chapter detailing a number of these categories. I think all of the ones we've mentioned so far are listed on this with a couple more um, with suggestions really on where to find the bulk of this information um, and sort of getting to what Judy was was alluding to earlier, you know, not all of it is online. Um, you know, the really useful stuff like temperament of, you know, a particular region in the state or, you know, who is most um, known or potentially influential to, you know, the one or two people that you find are not already supportive of this. Some of this is, uh, I imagine, things that you already know, um, but a lot of it likely is, is stuff that people you, you maybe aren't connected with yet could know. And so as we're doing this research and analysis, as, as everyone sort of has been doing, you know, from the second you probably got interested in this, it's, it's a total living process. It's information that you build up over time um, just by living in a particular place and, and sort of revisiting as you get more and more information. And um, we're going to key in on, I think, what Veronica brought up, you know, how to find out if your member of Congress is, if your members of Congress are supportive. Um, again, things like how to find out what's been attempted successfully or unsuccessfully so far at the state and local levels. And again, these sort of harder to define things like what's the character of my state? How does it vary place to place? Who are some of the the key networks of people influential to elected officials in my state? And and are they different depending on if my elected official is a Democrat or Republican or an independent, for examples? And yeah, again, these are the hard questions that we're trying to answer and we'll keep coming back to them as we learn more and more about our respective states and involve more and more people in this effort. So let's do another example here. And I'm hoping somebody can volunteer to share the name of their one of their members of Congress. Um, it could be a senator, it could be a house rep. And we're just going to do a little bit of a a quick um, dive into this particular person. So is there someone who wants to share um, the name of their member of Congress? And we'll use that as an example here. Great. Let's great. Thank you, Ted. Real quick, add on to what Vicki and uh, Veronica said is your question made me think about the fact that I'm, I'm in Columbus, Ohio, incidentally, and we're a red state. Sometimes they call us purple, we're really red. Like most other red states, our challenge is getting support from Republicans. But what occurred to me, because of your question is, there's a parallel between what's going on here. The Republicans are fighting with each other. We have a, a governor who's done a great job on the pandemic, and he's they're actually attempting to impeach him. Uh, the Republican Party is, bizarre as that sounds, but it's almost parallel to what's going on in the country. And my point being, it's going to be interesting to see, once we know who our legislators are, uh, we know it'll be two thirds Republican. What will happen? What will the dynamics be within their party? What will their priorities be? Will that possibly be an opportunity out of that discord, what are you going to call it, 
to make some uh, progress we weren't able to make when they were unified and were pretty much told by their leadership, you will not deal in campaign finance or you'll lose your funds. Uh, this, that could, dynamic could change. Uh, so I, I don't know if that resonates, but uh, your question raised that issue to me. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a senator, for example, who will be up in two years to your second question, uh, named Rob Portman, who used to be a very moderate person. I, as an independent, supported heavily. And unfortunately, he has gone to the dark side. Uh, he now answers <laughs> to the gun lobby and Mitch McConnell and was on the president's uh, re-election team. And just now today, finally decided it was safe to support the transition. Um, but so if you're looking for, I don't know if what kind of a, a representative or senator you want, but he is one that's gonna be interesting to see. Is he gonna to try to uh, straddle the fence, keep his- It's own... perfect, it's perfect. We, we, will use, we will use Rob Portman as, mm -hmm. as the example. And, and yeah, to your point, Ted, you know, it's good to not assume that the Democrats or the Republicans in your state are a homogenous block. Uh, because they're not. And, you know, there will be variations of differences of opinion um, and, and active schisms um, between the party members. And if you can understand where those lines break down, um, then all of a sudden you're really, you're really keen political analyst. <laughs> and, it, and if you're uh, figuring it out slowly from um, a distance, then, then you're like the rest of us. But let's, let's, um, let's key in on Senator Rob Portman here. And I'm going to share my screen. And the first thing that we're going to do is just figure out um, if he's already a co-sponsor of <laughs> Um, federal bills. So Ted, you might already know the answer, but what I'm going to do, I, I know he's, I know he's a senator, and I know in the Senate, SJR 51 is the bill that was introduced in the 116th Congress, and so I'm going to Google SJR 51. I'm going to type in Congress. I found that that works just about every time, and if you're on congress.gov you know you're in the right place and this co-sponsors tab is what i'm going to click and i like the control f feature so i'm just going to type command f that's search and i'm going to search for portman and okay nothing's coming up i'm just going to double check rob okay well there's a casey robert but that's a democrat and Pennsylvania, and I know that my control F is working. It, it showed me something. Um, so, okay, Rob Portman is not a co-sponsor. No, um, that, is, that is good for me to know. And next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to think through what issues are important to Rob Portman. So I'm gonna Google his name and I'm gonna use Ballotpedia. Um, a resource that I, I find particularly helpful. And here it comes right up, Rob Portman, Ballotpedia. Um, it's gonna give me a really thorough, um, but concise at the same time, summary of, you know, sort of his top line political accomplishments. And it's gonna give me a list of his committee assignments. You know, I see he's on a joint economic committee, a committee on foreign relations, finance, homeland security, and governmental affairs. It's likely on these committees because he's viewed as having some expertise in these areas. So just in this degree of research, um, who, what comes to mind? And um, you know, feel free to, to shout it out. Um, what comes to mind as you know a useful person or a useful group um, to work to bring into the Ohio chapter, for example, that might be able to improve our relationship with Rob Portman? J just from doing this level of research, does anything come to mind for folks? 
I don't know that this is particularly helpful, but one of the things that popped out at me is he's got nearly $14 million of net worth. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, you know, he's on the joint economic committee. We know he's extremely wealthy. Um, he's probably got a background in business and it potentially would be um, effective and um, intriguing for him, say, if a member of the Columbus Chamber of Commerce or a small business owner um, who could speak directly to how money and politics is impacting his or her business was, was say, in a meeting next to Ted um, and, his, and the rest of his um, Columbus chapter members. So that's one thing that I agree does jump off the page here as potentially something to really think through as we're doing this type of research. Um, so I'm going to scroll down here a little bit, you know, Ballotpedia really thorough job on committee assignments, um, tracks, key votes. And I find it's often helpful to also look at just their website because Ballotpedia will tell you sort of their assessment and they get some of it from Rob Portman's website, but let's just see. I mean, this says Senator Rob Portman front page. I'm not exactly sure what this is. I, I'm hoping to find his official website and, and here we are. Um, let's just look at say what he lists as his accomplishments. Um, this is straight from his communications director, probably with sign off from him. And our first insight was I think pretty accurate. Number one, jobs in the economy. Um, it's not a huge surprise and reinforces our thinking that the business voice is probably going to be a helpful voice to bring in if we can. Um, the second one's really interesting too, drug epidemic and opioids. Um, you know, we're able to pretty powerfully make a case for why if we get money out of politics, we're going to drastically improve a lot of people's lives um, and prevent the heartbreak that the opioid crisis causes to so many. Um, as we look at some of these other, even just top six accomplishments that Senator Portman wants people to know that he makes progress on all of these issues, um, do, do other groups of people or angles come to mind um, to people on the call that would be good to emphasize in our next conversation with Senator Portman. The Great Lakes and environment. Yeah, so, you know, continues to be a and leader in the bipartisan efforts. Bipartisan effort to protect the Great Lakes and our environment. Let's see what happens if we click to learn more. All right. Wow, he's the co chair of the Senate Great Lakes Task Force and Lake Erie is something that they spend a lot of time on. So, you know, my next thing I might think through would be, I'm gonna find who else is on the Great Lakes Task Force. And I'm gonna make note of that. Um, okay, you know, if I keep looking deeper here, okay, he's fighting to keep the lake clean, protecting from dangerous invasive species, algae blooms. Um, in order to strengthen fish and wildlife restoration efforts, I might, you know, do a little bit of research into the algal bloom cleanup companies bordering Lake Erie. And I might do some, you know, cold calling or reaching out to people and already in my networks to see if anyone has direct connections to any of these businesses. Just one example, but if you walked into Senator Portman's meeting, the next meeting you had with him, with someone involved in this cleanup of Lake Erie, you'd have a, a really compelling introduction of this person and, and why it's something that to this person, if, if they also can see the connection between money and politics and you know the pollution of Lake Erie, um, all of a sudden you might cut through some of that 
noise that Rob Portman is used to hearing when he thinks about campaign finance reform and all the reasons he doesn't want to support it or why it's not for him, all of a sudden you might, by changing up the messenger, um, have more of a chance for that breakthrough. So um, I, I don't think we need to go deeper into Rob Portman, but I, I'm curious to hear from folks um, if this is making sense and if you could see you know, the value in, in doing the same type of, you know, just like close assessment of what's information that's publicly out there that we could actually drive a lot of good um, strategic thinking and research and analysis really from. Yeah, like if you, if you were to then go into some of the local media and look up news stories about this, you could find out who some of the influences are uh, that are out you know, in, in the community um, that might be worth um, connecting with the influencers. If I mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and, and the media, the media fits into, into all of this, you know, I, I think as um, it, our, our subsequent trainings that we're going to do, um, you know, one a month for, for a couple of months here, it's something I'm excited to, to keep rolling out. We'll talk about you know, what are the various tactics that we can use to really um, take what we've learned and some of our, our baseline assumptions um, that we gain from this type of, of deep sort of foundational research at the onset? And how can we then translate that into, you know, a specific campaign, say, if we decided to maybe focus our campaign around Rob Portman will we'll stay on him. And as a, an example, we might learn in our research that he's up for re-election in 2022. And we might learn in our research that the last Senate race in Ohio was, was extremely expensive. And the presidential race that we just went through in Ohio was extremely expensive. And we might think, well, this 2022 race is probably gonna be close and it's probably gonna be very expensive. Um, and we might try to get 10 algal bloom um, professionals into our chapters next meeting to get them on board, for example. And we might then reach out to the Columbus Dispatch and say, we've got the algal bloom cleaners of Ohio um, making the case. And we, we'd love there to be a story about how there's a direct connection between Lake Erie's pollution and money and politics. And, and this could all be based on the research that we've just done. And so th these future trains will talk about how to sort of layer on these additional strategies. Um, but, but this is absolutely sort of the foundation that will be quite helpful, I think, um, to really move this forward. Yeah. Um, we made the or maybe we had the intro from Ted that uh, led us to believe that Rob Portman is aware of the amendment and that he's perhaps against it because he's not a, a co-sponsor, right? That's the methodology that we, we used. Um, but my first meeting with the member of Congress was Republican in New Jersey. And I was just shocked to find out that uh, the incumbent didn't know that there were bills to propose the amendment for three sessions before we got to his office. So uh, yeah. we right away made the assumption that, you know, okay, maybe he was against us when actually he was open. Uh, so not being a supporter is not the same thing as being um, uh, distracted or uh, having other priorities or things like that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, think the, I think the ballotpedia and the methodology that you're talking about here in order to get the research done is great, but just for, but first to answer the question, like where is the guy standing, mm -hmm. you right. know, where's the legislator standing is not necessarily their co-sponsor or their, you know, like the enemy and need to be dragged by, by research. It, yeah, that's, that's a good point, you know, from this sort of very preliminary assessment, you might then have a meeting with this, with this person in California, for example, and say, oh, you know, they're not a co-sponsor, but 
they actually don't even know that this bill exists. So I'm going to, you know, sort of rethink my, my assessment. And um, I, I see Anne has her hand up. So I, I want to make sure we give, give Anne a chance here. Um, thanks, thanks Azer. Actually, I'm noticing Monica's very important comment in the chat. And that's what I wanted to address. She oh, said, um, she says, it would be interesting to see on open secrets if he's taking money from polluters. So my mm -hmm. guess is the answer to that question is probably yes. And it's something that, you know, we are always going to encounter. And we need to think about how we frame our advocacy. So, you know, we don't want to make electeds the enemy because they are taking or are the beneficiaries of you know polluters money in this in this instance um we need to you know frame the argument in a way that underscores that this is a systemic problem that needs a systemic solution that it's not about demonizing individual politicians and also to kind of demonstrate to him, assuming he is the beneficiary of large amounts of money being thrown his way by polluters, demonstrate to him how it is in his best interest mm -hmm. to change the rules of the game. And that can be a real challenge for our advocacy because it's so easy to fall into the trap of demonizing people and saying well you know like down here in texas saying you know this guy gets tons of oil and gas money i mean we just we can't make any progress with them i think it's really about how you frame this to demonstrate that getting that getting on our side is in their interests regardless of how the money may or may not be flowing their way right now. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's well articulated and an important point. You know, I, I think of one um, section in particular of, of Jeff's book, actually, Corporations Aren't People, and he talks about um, if a system is broken and the incentives are skewed as our system currently is. Um, you can have people making decisions that logically make sense with how the rules are set up, but in practice might be counterintuitive to what the majority of Americans want or are, are working towards in, in this particular case. And it, it's a great reminder to not go in demonizing individuals making decisions to satisfy the conditions of a, a system that's out of whack. Um, I, I see Tom has his hand up. So Tom, thanks for sharing here or tell me if that's an accident that your hands up, but I, I think you're, you're on mute there. Okay, I, I'm not sure what, what the, um, Hank, do you have your hand up there too? Yeah. Can you hear me? Um, you can't hear me still? It's, it's quite muffled. It sounds like you're underwater. Yeah, I don't. I, well, let me try something. Uh, does it sound better here? It does, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, my computer just doesn't want to deal with my remote mic. Okay, here's, here's the point. I think in, in the vast majority of cases, any incumbent is not happy about the fundraising burden that's placed on them. Um, even, even if they like the money, they just as soon not have to spend hours chasing it. Um, and, and I think you need that only the really, really, really senior people, money comes to them. Otherwise people got to go chase. It. Um, and it, it's simply distracting and it's the necessary evil. And I think, I think it's fair to go into any meeting with elected reps, suggesting that we know it's another burden that they've got um, that it, it takes them away from legislating activity and none of them like it. And I think that, um, I think that's one of the things you can go and, and talk about when you, not only the, the, the if you will, public interest that they have and having people talk to them through that lens, but to acknowledge that uh, most of them find this 
just a huge frustration and that's part of the systemic change that we all recognize uh, is needed. And the reality is the people have to make this kind of change. Given, given that it's the rules of the road, it's the rules of the game, and you ignore them at your peril, and they want to get reelected or they want to be in public office, they got to play that game, and you don't win. And mm -hmm. I think adding that to the list of things that are mentioned uh, to get uh, a sympathetic ear, I think, should be always part of your list. Yeah, that, that's a great way to, to I think, pretty quickly. Um, find some common ground or Here's say something that Here's they're gonna relate to. Hey, Here's Maria, can I interrupt for a second? Somebody Please. is not muted and they have a conversation or a TV on in the background that's overriding the conversation. So if you're not speaking, can you please mute yourself, everyone? Thank you. Great, thanks, Maria. All right, well, we're gonna keep going here and Again, I'll emphasize, and we've sort of, I think, touched on this, it's, there's not a perfect science. Um, and I do hope that this template that um, we'll share with each chapter um, tomorrow morning will be helpful to organize this research and analysis with guidance on how to find this information that we've been talking through. And we're really at the end of this training here and i'd love to carve out a little bit of space just to hear from folks generally about you know broadly how we're feeling about this conversation um if it makes sense and i imagine much of this is work that you've all been doing um you know in, in variations of but we haven't had a discussion as purposeful as this before but would love to hear an example from someone of you know a time that that maybe you actually did research um, and it did translate into some tangible progress towards this amendment in your state. So is, is there anyone who'd wanna you know, sh share a specific example of um, a time where we did something like this and, and saw a direct impact because of it? Azor, can you hear me? Yep. Um, this is not an example, but it's a question. A lot of this cronyism occurs behind closed doors through organizations such as ALEC. Do you have any tips for researching what occurs at ALEC? How, um, I assume that their records are not publicly available, um, but I do read about ALEC from time to time. So, I'm not hearing what that organization is. I'm sorry to interrupt. But it's ALEC, the Ad Ad American Legislative Exchange Council. Uh, it is an, are you familiar with it? It's a very, I don't want to say clandestine, but it's a very understated organization that brings government leaders and business leaders together. And there's a lot of wheeling and dealing that occurs. ALEC, A-L-E-C, is responsible for writing legislation that congressmen and senators then pass. You know, it, it has all sorts of, or writing regulations that the US government then passes. And so they, they meet very privately with um, legislators <clears throat> to uh, put forward their agenda. And uh, it's a, you know, they, they come with big pockets and write big checks. Yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, that it, it's a it's a tangible example of, sort of the ideological opposition to what we're trying to do. Um, the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, and um, they operate at the state level um, with, with state reps and state senators and often are advocating for less regulation of um you know whatever you're looking at maybe it's air pollution standards or you know real estate development regulations um jane Mayer's book dark money features alec throughout as a, a pretty good example of you know what's really enabled in 
a destructive way when there's, you know, very few limits on money that can be spent in elections. And I don't have a, a perfect answer for you, Beverly. Um, one of the challenges is they're quite good at setting up n numerous, um, you know, 501c3s and 501c4s and passing money from super PAC to super PAC. And um, I, I would suggest um, using the old Google tool for one, um, you know, Alec, Texas, your particular state representative that you're um, focusing on and seeing if something comes up, they, they do a little bit of that type of promotion. Um, and Open Secrets does have a number of sort of analyses posted um, specifically about Alec, which I would imagine would have some um, deeper recommendations than than what I'm giving here on, on how to track this, but it's good to be aware of. Um, and it's a hard question to answer fully. Thank you. And they operate yeah. only at the state level, not at all at the federal level. Um, you know, that is my understanding. Yes. Okay. Hey, Azer. Um, yes. Does it make any sense to actually just ask a member of Congress if they have um, connections with or are working with Alec? I mean, is that a question that one would ask or is that too? Um, you know, it's, it's always good to think, well, what am I going to say next if they say yes and if they say no? Um, so it could be a, an effective strategy. Um, if you've thought the next question through. Uh, um, and I haven't thought it through in this, you know, 10 second conversation. I don't know what you would say, but it could be. Um, yeah. I believe that I'm Artis Nelson in Minnesota. I believe that Alec is also operating at the federal level because I've seen recently um, a federal um, Congress person be challenged because a bill or yes, a piece of legislation that he offered was accidentally still on ALEC stationary. And so somebody said, did you write this? You didn't write this. I mean, he was challenged on that because of that little oversight. Of leaving I remember it on that correct stationary. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and that's why I thought that they also operate at the, can you know, national level. Yeah, um, you know, and, and for any big project, um, for any big constitutional amendment effort, um, it's usually it's it's a strange sign if there's no opposition. Um, it's it's to be expected that there's opposition, um, and it, it's good to be aware of what that opposition looks like. And Al Alec is certainly squarely in that camp. Um, I, I want to um, keep going with the call here. I, I see Laura in the chat saying, you know, excited because research specifically on the candidate pledge helped make Republicans familiar with the work. And I know in California, they were successful in getting a number of Republicans to sign the pledge. Um, just by asking, you know, a couple of times and, and having some specific meetings with them following up. Um, but really the, I, I think, key point or, or one of the key points um, that this training is, is trying to emphasize is, I think summarized pretty well in this quote that I'll, I'm going to share. And if everyone, if, if anyone remembers um, some of the earlier trains we would do, um, they're familiar with the quotes and they're familiar with the quotes being repeated. And, and this quote is strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. And I'll repeat it. It's strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. And it's a quote from Sun Tzu in the art of war. And this research and analysis we're doing really will be our strategic foundation 
to guide our future tactics. And these future tactics are, are what the next trainings cover in depth. So we're, we're gonna do one of these trainings each month for the next four months now. Um, figure we'll do same time, same general day, the first Tuesday of the month. Um, you can mark your calendars. I hope that you'll attend the next one um, and, and invite your other chapter members to do the same um, for February 2nd, um, that Tuesday, same time, 7.30 to 8.30 Eastern time. And again, this, this will be recorded. We'll, we'll set up, I imagine, um, a specific YouTube playlist where we can access these recordings and we'll put these in the resource library as well. Um, tomorrow morning, Marnie will follow up with um, members from each chapter. And, you know, we've got a um, specific Google Doc template that I think will be quite helpful in organizing this information. Um, and, you know, we won't have obviously one document that everyone on this call shares because then we'd have you know people across the country working off the same document and that just wouldn't work but we want one sort of big research and analysis document for each chapter which i think it's a great way actually to loop in a couple members of your chapter to be working on various parts of this to lift up some other leaders um, in your group at the same time and, and have a really important collaborative project. So we'll follow up in, in that way tomorrow morning. Um, and I'll, I'll just thank everyone really for being engaged in this effort, for wanting to be part of this strategic conversation, which I know everyone's been having variations of for as long as you've been in this, but um, thanks for engaging in, in this purposeful way. And, and we'll end two minutes or so early here. Um, so thanks you guys. Um, it, it's always a pleasure and, um, really glad to be doing this work all together.